Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. My name is Erin Melano Bailey. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co-host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and owner at Cognitive Behavior Institute. And on this week's episode, we are joined by Dr. Brian Killick, who is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine, where he conducts research in the field of substance use disorder treatment. Specifically, Dr. Killick's research includes a focus on the evaluation and enhancement of a web-based version of cognitive behavioral therapy called CBT for CBT that has demonstrated efficacy at treating alcohol and drug use disorders in multiple clinical trials. He is the principal investigator of several NIH-funded research grants from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and his work has been featured at national scientific meetings. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Killick. Um, Could you share with our listeners a little bit about how you became interested in mental health and in substance abuse and alcohol abuse? Sure, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, So I first uh, got interested in psychology and as an undergrad, I'm really interested in understanding behavior change um, and uh, personality characteristics. And um, I got my first job as a research assistant working with Dr. Kathy Carroll here at Yale, um, who was doing substance use disorder research and development of psychotherapies uh, to treat substance use disorders. Uh, So being involved in some of the clinical trials and working with participants who were in these studies uh, who were struggling with substance use um, really sparked my interest uh, in working with this uh, population and trying to help understand what are some uh, factors that are contributing to their continued substance use, what are some of the best ways to treat their substance use and help them to reduce um, their, their use in a way that can improve their functioning. Um, the challenges involved in that uh, were uh, became really apparent, and I think that was uh, in part uh, what uh, furthered my interest in this area and wanted me to get more involved in it. No, I think it was, uh, it's very good research that I've I've been following to some degree. Uh, uh, And can you tell us a little bit about uh, CBT for CBT, Uh, particularly I think during the pandemic has uh, definitely magnified the need for alternatives. Uh, You know, my first experience was prior to the pandemic, but it seems more than ever that this is a good intervention. Yeah, yeah. So um, CBT for CBT stands for Computer-Based Training for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, It was uh, developed in the early to mid-2000s by Dr. Kathy Carroll um, as a way to provide a high-quality level um, of delivery of the concepts and skills uh, that would be incorporated into a cognitive behavioral therapy treatment program uh, for substance use. Um, so was, this web program is designed to deliver these skills and teach concepts and skills um, in an engaging and high quality way directly to uh, patients. Uh, providing this through a web-based platform has been very convenient in the current environment um, and where remote delivery is uh, at a high priority. So it has been uh, really useful in that way. However, at the same time, there are still multiple challenges faced given access to technology and the ability to um, access this program from from various areas uh, is still a challenge. Um, So while it is more convenient uh, and uh, has a lot of evidence behind it to suggest that it is uh, effective, um, there are still many challenges faced for people with just trying to get access to technology and to access this program. Now, my original uh, interaction was with Dr. Tar- Dr. Carroll a few years back. Can you speak to what has developed over the last few years, specifically about research and populations? So specifically the variables of type of uh, substances that this has been helpful for, as well as the populations, uh, whether it be ethnicity, age, gender, what have you, that this has been shown to be efficacious for? 
Yeah, so the original program, uh, as I mentioned, developed in the early 2000s was a really basic, um, in terms of technology, really basic program. It was developed on a CD, DVD uh, a platform um, designed to be applicable to various substances of abuse, not for one particular substance in general uh, or uh, specifically. So um, early trials uh, enrolled participants with various types of substance use disorders, uh, cocaine, alcohol, marijuana, um, other stimulants. And so the goal was to be able to deliver CBT in, in a more general way. So that way people are learning skills that are not just necessarily applicable to one particular substance. Um, over time, we have since uh, improved and enhanced the program, obviously updated the type of platform and made it a web-based delivery and tried to include a few more interactive pieces that weren't possible initially. Um, and we have created a, a version specifically for those that are struggling with alcohol use. Uh, so the content and some of the situations are tailored for alcohol users. Um, but we do have a more general program that would be applicable to multiple types of substances. Um, in terms of population, uh, ethnicity, and, and race, uh, our trials have generally uh, included uh, general populations, those who are seeking treatment in outpatient facilities, um, which has been a, a broad range of racial and ethnic categories. We've had a, a highly diverse sample in our, in our studies. Um, we have, although, uh, recently created a, a version specifically for Spanish speakers. Um, so we developed a, a version, not just translating the English program into Spanish, but incorporating a lot of uh, cultural values uh, from the Latinx community um, into the program uh, and created it entirely for it's all in Spanish. And so um, to make that more tailored for that particular population. Can you speak so, so we have a general program, an alcohol only program and a Spanish speaking program. Awesome. You know, one of the things I think that is also interesting to hear is can you talk about the outcomes, Compare, comparing, you know, whether it be meds alone, meds and CBT for CBT, standard CBT, can you speak to that? Yeah, so <clears throat> outcomes in substance use disorder research are, are really interesting um, because many might think of them as sort of a success failure, uh, where success being the person has completely stopped their substance use. Um, <clears throat> we tend to not look at it that way uh, as more on a continuous scale. So we have found that those that, that have accessed the program tend to reduce their rates of substance use over time during a treatment program, uh, more so than compared to those that would get a standard treatment. Um, this would be in addition to medication. So those who are on a medication, if, if they're added, if CBT for CBT is added to their treatment program, they tend to reduce their substance use over time more so than without it. Um, and this effect actually lasts beyond just the treatment period, which is a really attractive part of the program, um, and also mimics the effect found in uh, clinician-delivered cognitive behavioral therapy, where people continue to use skills and master them in a way such that the, the impact or the benefits go beyond just when the treatment period ends. Um, and so we have seen success rates uh, in terms of reductions in substance use over time, uh, for those that get the CBT for CBT program beyond just our brief eight to 12 week treatment period up to six and, and as many as 12 months after the treatment period. Have you any thoughts about what do you think the differences are with those applying the CBT skills from person to person versus this structured approach? So one of the strategies I think that we've tried to incorporate in the program is to make it highly engaging. Uh, there's a lot of didactics and teaching involved in cognitive behavioral therapy and doing that one-on-one -on -one with an individual. Sometimes you use visual aids or, or other ways to, to teach a skill. But through the web program, we're able to incorporate a lot more interactive pieces. Um, the main driver of our content or the way that we deliver the skills is through uh, video-based vignettes, so short movies. We have uh, a team where we've developed scripts for different situations that individuals might encounter uh, that are high risk for substance use. We have actors, we go on locations, and we shoot these brief movies as a way to engage people in a story to see the type of situations uh, that are hopefully uh, applicable to them that they struggle with. Um, following that 
uh, movie, we have a series of uh, screens and exercises to teach them how to particularly how to use a particular CBT skill to navigate that scenario. And then they watch this movie again um, with the actors in the scene um, utilizing the skill. So they sort of get to see it uh, in practice. Um, it incorporates a bit more modeling aspect of, of uh, teaching or learning and behavior um, in CBT that you couldn't otherwise do one on one. Gotcha. And I know that this is a very self-guided program, but could you speak a little bit to what role clinicians could have um, if their clients who they're working with are engaging in this as well? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. There's uh, definitely a huge role for clinicians uh, in incorporating this program. All of our trials really have evaluated this within the context of uh, an outpatient treatment or some other setting. So there is certainly clinician involvement in it. Um, from the initial design of it, as well as our current thinking, this is not set up as a replacement of a clinician, but more of a clinician extender. Um, and so those clinicians who are working with uh, clients who may be utilizing this program can use it to supplement, to check in, to see if their uh, client is using these skills, what they're practicing, what they're learning from it, um, and incorporated that into their sessions as well. So uh, this is certainly not designed to um, be the program that's going to replace the clinician, but use it as a, a supplement. And has this been looked at from an inpatient, using this in an inpatient setting, or has it strictly been outpatient? That's a great question. Uh, very timely because uh, we currently just received, I currently just received uh, uh, an NIH uh, grant award to evaluate this within uh, individuals who are inpatient hospitalized for a medical condition, but uh, also uh, meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder. So we do are, are expanding our settings and the types of uh, places that we're trying to implement CBT for CBT. The bulk of our thus far has been in outpatient settings, but uh, we have also looked at this uh, in primary care settings as well and trying to think about other places where we can provide access to people. And so inpatient is definitely one of those. Great. Uh, can you tell us kind of uh, what has been the adoption of this uh, in different, uh, beyond your research, has it been adopted outside and kind of uh, outside the clinical research setting and just, just in a clinical setting? Yeah, so um, early on, there was a lot of interest in this. Uh, Dr. Carroll set up uh, an LLC to manage the distribution and, and deliver it because there were many uh, uh, facilities, institutions, healthcare settings that, that were interested in, in incorporating this. And so um, there is a, a separate uh, company that is uh, set up to provide or distribute uh, the licenses for CBT for CBT. It has been incorporated um, in various uh, settings and agencies across, I think, 28 or 29 states it's in now, as well as Canada. Um, this includes uh, rural populations, um, other areas, healthcare agencies that have adopted it and, and purchased the licenses so they can deliver it to their uh, clients. Are you able to speak with the general cost is to for one, one client usage? So right now, the there's sort of two main ways that people can get access to CBT for CBT. One is through the, the LLC, which I mentioned, uh, and that provides it at a cost of around $100 per uh, patient. Um, and that would be for uh, individual, uh, sort of individual level uh, delivery. Um, we do, we have partnered with uh, another company, Chess Health, uh, who has a, a more comprehensive package that incorporates CBT for CBT as one of their treatment offerings. Um, and so they are an exclusive partner to provide this to other healthcare agencies. They, they go through third party payers and insurance companies uh, to have them incorporate this into their uh, package. Um, and that, I'm not exactly sure what the cost of that is, but that's usually generally more for larger healthcare organizations rather than individual providers. Interesting. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about where they can find information, um, you know, if they're interested in, in the, the route of an individual client of theirs getting access to this? Could you share with us where they could go to find that information? Yeah, so uh, we have a website, uh, CBT4, the number four, CBT.com. 
Um, this provides all of the information regarding the program. There's information, a section for providers, for patients, uh, a resource section. Um, all of our uh, data and evidence behind it is also provided in there. There's a brief demo for people that can watch uh, about a five to 10 minute clip of what this program sort of looks like and how patients might interact with it, um, as well as a section for providers to to help them figure out how to incorporate this and how they might use it as well with their patients. Wonderful. And could you give us a little bit of a preview on the 2022? I know you mentioned this, the setting as far as um, you know doing the inpatient study, but what else is on the horizon that you could share with us? Yeah, so there, there's a lot. Um, and we currently have a, a trial that just started a few months ago where we're um, incorporating this into uh, the community of uh, individuals who are uh, engaged within the Black Church. Um, so Dr. Ayanna Jordan, who was here at Yale as well, um, has a study where she's looking at providing and delivering CBT for CBT uh, in settings outside of traditional healthcare settings. So, and that's one of the ways that we're thinking about how to better provide access to people rather than uh, allowing those who are currently engaged in treatment or are seeking treatment at an outpatient or inpatient facility, um, bringing it out into the community and getting it, um, getting those who may be struggling with substance use, but not willing to access or, or seek treatment in a more formal setting, how can we provide them access? So that's one, one strategy. Um, another I mentioned is the, the inpatient setting. And there are also, uh, we currently are in the works of developing a program uh, a version of the program for those who are uh, have chronic pain and are struggling with opioid use. Uh, we have various uh, options and uh, promising avenues to pursue regarding the type of versions, uh, uh, particular populations that we can develop a new uh, program for uh, that takes a lot of time, um, but that's one that we're near the ending of and are ready to start a clinical trial. Um, to evaluate CBT for CBT for those with opioid use disorder and chronic pain. Well, we would love to have you back to discuss uh, your findings in the future. So hopefully we can stay in touch because we do know that um, that continues to plague a lot of a lot of clients, a lot of a lot of people out there in the community. So we're we're really excited to hear about additional resources. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, this is a great, great product for the clinicians that are watching. I think, you know, we talk about access. Access is, you know, internet and, and device, but the other is capacity. And due to the pandemic, capacity is a real issue. And this is a real strong alternative for those that are even maybe not addiction focused behavioral health providers, but can use this as an adjunct. Uh, hopefully that will get some benefit. And it's a reasonable price, it sounds like to me, for those that are either in transition or at least maybe uh, something to, to utilize that may be helpful. So I appreciate the work. Sure, thank you. Um, one thing I would mention, uh, I'd like to add at least from our, our research is not just, we found not just improved uh, reductions in substance use or improved outcomes that way. We've also seen that people who, uh, or patients who are using CBT for CBT tend to engage in their treatment more. Uh, so they, they've shown up at their uh, clinic appointments more than those that haven't gotten the program. And so this may be also a way to um, get uh, individuals engaged in treatment who might not, not otherwise um, have that level of engagement. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Killick. We're very excited to have had you with us and we appreciate your time and research. And uh, if you, we invite our, our listeners to visit the CBT number four, CBT dot com website to learn more about CBT for CBT. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. And thank you so much to our listeners of this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.